Good morning. So, announcements. Next week uh, is going to be our um, kickoff for the, um, the comeback of the, the church season. And um, there will be refreshments and uh, hot dogs and chips and drink and we'll have that outside. There's also going to be games uh, and prizes for, for kids. Um, and uh, if you can make it, it would be wonderful. Um, look, look for some old faces we haven't seen in a while maybe and uh, just anybody new who might be around. That would be a great way to welcome them in. Them in. Uh, there is a coffee hour today, so the return of the coffee hour has now commenced, and that's a, that's a good thing. I think it's a great way to spend a little bit of time just saying hi and catching up. Um, also, uh, before I forget, uh, through, um, through some folks, I didn't even think about it, they made, um, they made some donations to the church for school supplies. So next week, um, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll make some school supplies available to, uh, to, to folks. All right. So uh, I've announced it uh, already. Uh, September 25th, there will not be a, an 8.30 service because I will be in Dummerston, Vermont, I believe, while Sean Bracebridge will be preaching here. Um, please come and welcome Sean. And uh, we have our business meeting in October. And uh, again, one of the things that are going to be on that agenda is conversation about open and affirming. And um, please come to the meeting, ask questions, voice your opinion, let people know what you think, how you feel. Um, what your concerns are. Uh, we are a church, and um, you know the the idea is that um, we we share with each other how we feel and how we think and how we behave. Um, I'm bringing that up because what's going to happen is there's going to be a special meeting in November uh, on the uh, on the vote for open and affirming. So. Um, I would like all people to come and say what they have to say. It is, it's, it is a part of, going to be a part of our history. Um, whichever way that vote swings, it's going to be a part of our history. Um, and I think that is all I have. Does anybody have any announcements? Kathy. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, I'm lighting our celebration candle um, with the hopes of um, with the hopes of of people returning to church, uh, spending time getting to uh, reacquaint themselves with their church family, and also to um, get an understanding of one another as we are all siblings of, of this church family. Um, I'm also uh, lighting our celebration candle in, um, in prayers for peace. The Lord be with you. Let us greet each other with the passing of the peace of Christ.
Let us um, read um, responsively this morning's call to worship. Listen to the ordinances of our God. Love God and walk in the way God commands. Happy are those who delight in God's law. Blessed are all who meditate on God's word. not in daily communion with God, false gods rush in to claim our loyalty. We chase after things that do not profit. We become cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Only God can fill our emptiness. Let us join together in our prayer of confession. Awesome God, we confess that we have become slaves to our own narrow self-interests. We pay more attention to our possessions than to you. We try to hide from your all-seeing eye, for we are guilty of devotion to false gods. We are attracted to wicked advice and sinful pursuits that direct our steps away from you. We act without thinking or planning or consulting you. O oh God, show us the way to a better life. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Grace to you and peace from God. Refresh your hearts in Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Receive the living water God offers to all who come in true repentance and searching faith. The Holy Spirit will never leave us or forsake us. Our helper is ever available and eager to respond to our prayers. Come there is a place at God's banquet table for you. Please be seated.
This short letter addressed to three specific individuals was written by Paul during an imprisonment, perhaps in Rome between AD 61 and 63. It concerns Onesimus, a slave from Colossae, who had run away from his master. Perhaps he was guilty of a theft of some sort. Onesimus was converted to Christ by Paul, and Paul sends him back to his master with this letter asking that he be welcomed willingly by his old master, not just as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. From Paul, a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. To our friend and fellow worker Philemon, and the church that meets in your house, and our sister Aphia, and our fellow soldier Archippus. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Brother Philemon, every time I pray, I mention you and give thanks to God, for I hear of your love for all of God's people and the faith you have in the Lord Jesus. My prayer is that our fellowship with you as believers will bring about a deeper understanding of every blessing which we have in our life in union with Christ. Your love, dear brother, has brought me great joy and much encouragement. You have cheered the hearts of all of God's people. So far, so good, right? For this reason, I could be bold enough as your brother in Christ to order you to do what should be done. But because I love you, I make a request instead. I do this even though I am Paul, the ambassador of Christ Jesus, and at present also a prisoner for his sake. So I make a request to you on behalf of Onesimus, who is one of my own sons in Christ. For while in prison, I became his spiritual father. At one time, he was of no use to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you now, and with him goes my heart. I would like to de keep him here with me while I am in prison for the gospel's sake, so that he could help me in your place. However, I do not want to force you to help me. Rather, I would like for you to do it of your own free will. So I will not do anything unless you agree. It may be that Onesimus was away from you for a short time so that you might have him back for all time. And now he is not just a slave, but much more than a slave. He is a dear brother in Christ. How much he means to me and how much more he will mean to you, both as a slave and as a brother in the Lord. So if you think of me as your partner, welcome him back just as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Here, I will write this with my own hand. I, Paul, will pay you back. I should not have to remind you, of course, that you owe me yourself. So, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. As a brother in Christ, cheer me up. I'm sure as I write this that you will do what I ask. In fact, I know that you will do even more. This ends our reading from the book of Philemon. In the passage assigned for this week from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus spells it out clearly. The cost of discipleship requires putting the vision of God first in your life, ahead of the vision of home and family of our own little kingdom. Our Gospel reading is from Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. 
Once, when a large crowd of people were going along with Jesus, he turned and said to them, Those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and themselves as well. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. If one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and figure out what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation, and all, you, and all who see what happened will make fun of you. You begin to build but can't finish the job, they say. If a king goes out with 10,000 men to fight another king who comes against him with 20,000 men, he will sit down first and decide if he is strong enough to face that other king. If he isn't, he will send messengers to meet the other king to ask for terms of peace while he is still a long way off. In the same way, Jesus concludes, none of you can be my disciple unless you give up everything you have. This ends our reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus telling people to put him first, to love him more than our father or mother or wife or children, brother or sister. We can't be disciples unless we put him first. I, I think I, I should clarify something with that. He doesn't say denounce. He doesn't say uh, disrespect. Um, he, he is not telling us to um, deny our relationship with our family. What he's saying is, give your heart to me. I will tell you what to think. I will tell you what to do. Um, and let's say hypothetically, I had a father that didn't like black people. Um, well, am I going to let my father's prejudice stop me from liking a black person? He's just as human as anybody else, capable of, of having um, issues that um, are not necessarily my concern. As humans, we are fallible. We don't know all the answers to life questions, and we will often make mistakes. And the type of mistakes we make are, you know, who we are as disciples of Christ. A disciple is a person who chooses to follow someone or something. In our case, as Christians, we choose to follow Jesus. WWJD. What would Jesus do? That acronym was another thing that used to get under my skin. I'm not sure why. Um, it could be because I think it was almost making it sound a little flippant. I don't know. But now I know that is a very, very serious question to ask yourself. As a disciple of Christ, we need to ask ourselves, what would our teacher, what would our master have us do? Maybe you remember Colin Kaepernick. He was a quarterback who refused to stand for the national anthem and actually took a knee, right? That caused a lot of anger and resentment and um, you know, feelings of not being patriotic. A lot of people condemning him, a lot of death threats. And I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with his decision. But it led me to wonder, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus treat him? And though I don't know exactly what Jesus would say or do, I know that he would do it in a loving way. He would let Colin know that he is still loved. 
because he is a child of God. If your child did something you considered wrong, would you stop loving the child and start name calling? Would you do anything in your power to publicly embarrass and humiliate this child? Probably not. You may not like your child's actions or behaviors, but you'll still love them, more than likely. And what we sometimes fail to understand is that we are all children of God, that we are all beloved people, that we are all brothers and sisters. So we, we often think of the n nuclear family, but Christ calls us to open it up. We have a right to free speech, but that doesn't mean that we express our feelings with vulgarity, contempt, or hate. As Jesus' disciples, as followers of Christ, we are called to stand up for what is right, but to do so in a loving way. Expression of love are not, easily, are not easy, especially when someone ticks us off. And let me just add this. There are guilty people out there. There are people that are plain old mean and rotten. Um, but that still shouldn't make us mean and rotten. Usually our response is, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. You hurt my family, oh boy, are you going to pay. That's kind of like the norm, right? And it's understandable. You protect who and what you love. I liked how Desmond Tutu said we should work with our enemies. He says, if you want peace, you need to talk to your enemies, not your friends. Your friends are going to agree with you. Your friends are going to make you feel all warm and cuddly. Your enemies are going to put you to the test, if it's a discussion. They'll make you examine what you're doing and what you're believing. What do people do nowadays when they have an argument? They post it. Pastor Dave said such and such. Oh my goodness. They don't talk. They're out to destroy a business, knock somebody down, do whatever it is to cause them harm, embarrass them. We will not find the peace of Christ in our lives by humiliating and tearing someone else down. Again, I reiterate, reiterate, we don't need to agree on an issue. However, conversation versus violence works much better at ending with a peaceful resolution. Following Jesus will not lead us astray, but it will very much lead us into difficult situations and conflict. The movie the Long Walk Home gives us an idea of what Jesus meant about counting the cost before signing up for anything. This movie is not about following Jesus. It's about doing the right thing in difficult circumstances. And that's exactly what Jesus was warning that we would have to do if we became his disciples. As Christ's disciples, we can expect him to call us to do the right thing, even though the circumstances might be very challenging. That movie, The Long Walk Home, was set in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. That was the year that Martin Luther King Jr. organized a boycott of city buses in response to a requirement that Negroes sit in the back of the bus. The movie features two women, Miriam Thompson, a white woman, and Odessa Cotter, who is Miriam's maid. Because of the boycott, Odessa is walking to and from work nine miles each way. 
Miriam could see that Odessa was tired, so she offered to drive her back and forth. That movie is a good illustration of what Jesus was saying about putting Christian loyalties above family loyalty. You see, Miriam's husband was opposed to the boycott and opposed to his wife driving Odessa back and forth. Nevertheless, Miriam thought it was the right thing to do. But then Odessa warned Miriam that the police were harassing drivers with blacks in the car, stopping them, giving them tickets. Miriam said, I bet I'll get lots of tickets. Then Odessa warned that tickets would just be the beginning and suggested other ways that Miriam could help. She could write a check to help the, the boycott effort, but Miriam didn't want to write a check. She said it would be Norman's money. Norman, of course, is her husband who opposed the boycott. But Odessa said, when it's all said and done, people are going to look at you, Mrs. Thompson, and they're going to say that you were a part of this. To which Miriam replied, let me say what they're going to, let, let people say what they're going to say. Then Odessa said, and what about when it, isn't just the buses, when it's the parks and the restaurants, when it's colored teachers in white schools. How about when we start voting, Mrs. Thompson, because we will, and when we do, we're going to put Negroes in office. What about when the first colored family moves into your neighborhood? You know, Mrs. Thompson, ain't nobody going to think any less of you if we just turn around and go back to the house. It's that kind of thing that Jesus was warning us about when he said that we need to count the cost before becoming his disciples. Because Jesus will call us to be strong when it would be easier to just go along with everyone else. He will call us to say yes when everything inside of us wants to say no. And he will call us to say no when everything inside of us wants to say yes. Following Jesus can be painful. We will be asked to love people that rub us the wrong way. Following Jesus can be costly. But I've come to learn that it is through Jesus I am finding my strength and my peace is growing. Yours can too. Amen.
I do have some prayer requests to share with you. Um, from Carola Erickson, my niece Kim, major surgery on her ankle and will be bedridden for four to six weeks. From Carol Erickson, prayers for Ann Davis, Rita Stearns, Edie Johnson, and Teresa, all for healing. From Ron, prayers of healing for Elaine and Mike, and prayers for Nancy living in a motel after a fire at her apartment. Prayers for those fighting the, this wave of COVID. From Edie Johnson, for Teresa Johnson and Tom Johnson. From Bernice, for Emily, testing positive for COVID. Let us come together in spirit of prayer. Oh Lord, it costs much to walk with you. Carrying a cross, clinging to no thing, no one, except for God's glory. Family, friends, favorite chairs, homes, portfolio, clothes, cars, books. Those things that we covet, help us let go of them and take them back up when it's only for you. In that which we treasure, give us yourself. Be what we need. Be our light, our sun, our moon, our everything. We ask that you now hear these the silent prayers of our hearts and minds. God of compassion, strength, and truth. We know you love us in all the messiness that we call our lives. Strengthen us and encourage us to be your disciples. May we open our hearts to your will. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join in our church's uh, mission statement. Our church exists to cultivate the love of God and our community and to build a deep conviction that we are all beloved, valued people of worth who are devoted to following Jesus and doing God's work. We welcome and seek Christ's living presence in our town and beyond. Our church is a place of worship, inspiration, learning, and discovery. We serve our community and are the arms, hands, and voice of God's love. This morning's offerings will now be received.
Let us join together in our offertory prayer of thanksgiving. Loving God, there is no way we can settle accounts with you. We have no way to repay you for all we have received from your hands. Yet we want to give you our best to the work you call us to do through this community of seekers. We enter with a renewed commitment and confidence the costly adventure of spreading love through your world. Amen. and said to them, This is my body, broken for you. As often as you break bread, do so in remembrance of me. Again on that same night, Jesus took a cup up off the table. As was the custom, he blessed it, he gave thanks for it, and then he handed it to his disciples and said to them, this is the blood of a new covenant poured out for many in the forgiveness of sins. Truly I say unto you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven.
This is the bread and blood of the new covenant in Christ. Take, eat, and drink. Let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work for your praise and glory. May we live in true love, a love that asks more of us than just getting by. As our service of worship comes to an end, our service to one another now begins. Go in peace and stop downstairs and have a snack. Amen. <laughs>